in India. And they were written, they were being composed about the same time as the Hebrews were at work on the oldest text of the Bible, Genesis 2 in particular, with which I would like to contrast uh, the, uh, the myth of the Upanishads. And uh, the Upanishads are actually filled with a number of different kinds of creation myths. There isn't, there isn't any one uh, particular myth to which they have um, ascribed the origin of all things because each one of the myths, each one of the different creation myths are recognized as essentially saying the same thing. They are metaphoric statements, and the Hindus recognize that they are metaphoric statements of something that cannot be conceived in human thought. And the best thing we can do is to picture them in metaphoric language. But um, my favorite one is the one that begins with the great self who was neither male nor female and was just sort of floating. I don't know if you can imagine it like the star child at the end of 2001, just sort of floating there in the void for who knows how long. And then one day it said, I am. And from out of that primordial utterance, it suddenly became afraid because it realized that it was alone in this vast, infinite, empty cosmic space. And from out of its fear came a desire that there should be another. And so it split into half, like cellular mitosis, into a male half and a female half. And the male had sexual desire for the female, but she decided to transform herself into a cow. He changed himself into a bull. They made it. They produced all the cattle. She changed herself into a mare. He changes himself into a stallion. They made to produce all the horses, and so on, down to the ants. Then one day, the male version of this uh, primordial pair is walking in the garden. He looks around at everything that he sees, and he says, suddenly the thought occurs to him, I am all of this that I have poured forth. I am consubstantial with the cosmos. That is to say, the central insight in Hindu metaphysics is the idea that the great self, Brahman, is manifest in all things. Every rock, every stone, every tree, every particle is a manifestation of the divine mystery of the cosmos. Even the gods themselves are but mere personifications of this primordial, mysterious being. The universe has created itself from out of itself, spontaneously, organically. Now I'd like to contrast that image with what we get in Genesis 2. We actually look in Genesis 2, and it was written about the same time. And we find that there, in the beginning, there is a mist or a flood that has moistened the earth, and God is sort of hovering above it, and he reaches down into the earth, and he scoops up a ball of mud, and he molds it into Adam. He sort of goes like that, blows on it, and Adam goes walking around, this clay figurine, and God scoops up a series of these clay figurines, molds them into these animals, and presents them to Adam. And he says, here, name these, and while you're at it, see if you can find a mate. Adam gives the names to the various animals, and it is not apparent to him that there is a companion fit for him among them. He explains the story to God. And God says, all right, I'll take care of it. Puts him asleep, and he breaks off a rib like a twig from Adam and molds Eve out of them. Now, it's interesting there to contrast this image in Genesis 2 with the Upanishadic myth, because here we have a totally different vision of the relationship of the spirit to the world. Here, the paradigm is of a kind of Neolithic pottery craftsmaker. We are to imagine a kind of pottery maker at his wheel molding something that is totally separate from his own self. The world and all that is within it is not divine. It is not consubstantial with the God who has made it. God is separate. God is up here, the world is down here. The world is not alive, it is not self-moving, it has to be breathed upon from above in order for it to become animate. Until that happens, you have simply empty matter. But in the Hindu myth, on the other hand, everything is alive. Space itself is filled with a living substance called ether, the akasha, which itself is alive. It's a kind of cosmic memory. Everything is alive in the Hindu vision. And so in the West, we have inherited this vision that nature is something to be conquered and overmastered by force. It was given to the dominion of man for our usage, our usage, for our natural resources. And so we view it as this sort of dead panoply of resources that can be plundered to infinite extent because we have been sanctioned by the divine for this to take place. We are, after all, at the top of the great chain of being on the earthly planet. But that has really gotten us into a sticky situation now with respect to the entire planet. The industrial nation state 
that was created from out of this, that really is a kind of secular version of the biblical cosmos, that was created out of this is dangerously overstraining the planet's natural resources. We have moved now into the sixth great extinction, whereby animals are being extinguished faster now than they have ever been in the past, since the time of the dinosaurs, 65 million years ago. There have been smaller extinctions in between, and they happen periodically. This is happening very quickly, and a lot of it is related to deforestation, stripping the forests to set up places to feed the cattle, to feed us hamburgers at McDonald's. And so we're really, we've committed ourselves here to a kind of industrial paradigm that everything is working well and good for the time being, but in the meantime, we're destroying the very fabric of the world within which we live, and we're robbing ourselves of the potential to have a future. So we are living in this situation where we are stuck in the present. And so it's a, it's a very tricky problem, and it remains to be seen what will come out of this. But it has come out of the whole biblical vision of the world. Now I want to uh, move from Genesis 2 to one of my favorite creation myths, which is the, the Egyptian cosmos. And um, the Egyptians are similar in many ways to the Hindu cosmology. They have a very organic, vegetal vision of the cosmos where things just arise and emerge spontaneously. In the beginning was chaos. And the Egyptians call it nun. And it's just water, undifferentiated stuff. And from out of it, slowly, this lotus rises to the surface and unfolds its petals. And there, sitting upon it, is a god. This is Atum. Later, this god became Ray, the sun god. So we're imagining almost the sun sort of rising up out of this plant. So we're rising up out of the Nile. And this god masturbates. And from out of the ejaculation come the first two primordial gods, the male and female god, Shu and Tefnu. They're brother and sister. And Shu is the god of the air, and Tefnu is the goddess of moisture. They propagate the next pair of gods, Newt and Jeb. Newt is the sky goddess, and Jeb is the earth god. But they were laying on top of each other, and here you'll notice, you'll notice in the Egyptian cosmogony, the woman's on top. That's significant with respect to the Egyptians still having respect for the matriarchal perspective. The woman is on top, and the two are made, but Atum doesn't like the incest that's involved here. So he tells Shu to separate them, prevent this from happening. So Shu, the air god, steps in and pushes Newt up and Jeb, the earth god, down. So this is the primordial separation of heaven and earth. And this is a motif that appears in creation myths all over the world, this separation of heaven from earth. And he is the god of air, so it's the spirit that does this. But uh, Newt and Jeb have already created four more gods. Isis and Osiris, the brother-sister pair, and their brother and sister Nephthys and Seth. Now, there's a rather comical story that follows from this. Osiris one night mistakes his brother's wife Nephthys for Isis and sleeps with her. And from out of that comes uh, this little jackal-headed boy called Anubis. And Anubis is the god of resurrection. The priests, when they mummify the bodies, wear the mask of Anubis. And um, Set takes great offense, of course, as you would expect. And uh, he decides to throw this party. He builds a sarcophagus. And at the party, he invites all the gods. They all get hilariously drunk. And Set says, anyone who can fit into this coffin can have it. And so this is like the Cinderella with the glass slipper. Everybody tries it on. Nobody fits. It fits Osiris perfectly. He gets in. They throw the lid on, put 72 nails in it, and throw it out into the Nile. It goes floating up the Nile, out into the Mediterranean, and it lands in Syria. And when it lands there, a tree grows up around it. There's Osiris within the sarcophagus, and the tree has grown up around it. And a king happens to be wandering by with his retinue at just this time, and he's looking for a palace for a pillar to hold up his palace. And he likes the smell of this tree. So he has it cut down, and he builds his palace, and has it put in as the central pillar. Isis, meanwhile, has gotten wind of all of this, and she has followed 